Hello and welcome to episode 374 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, welcome back. How are you doing? I've got that feeling, Andy, of being somewhat pulled from pillar to post this week because I've been doing loads for uh, different national newspapers, actually, and even had requests from other podcasts for national newspapers. But it's been so hectic that sometimes it's quite nice just to come and do something like the podcast, that's something you do every week, and almost a bit of silence as well, because only me and you in the room at this point in time. Yeah, and the dodgy aircon. Yes, and the dodgy aircon. I don't know if people ever... Have you ever listened to this podcast and hear a funny buzz noise in the background? <laughs> it's because Andy and I, if we're together like we are today, we have the aircon on and turn it off just as we start to record so it doesn't pick it up. And it gets really hot in the room, but the aircon takes on a life of its own and occasionally <laughs> makes these crazy buzzes. But on a different note, we've had some more reviews this week, which has been fantastic. We'll share those probably next week. But one person I did want to thank is Mariana, who wrote on Twitter recently to say that a particular podcast episode had been living rent free in her mind for weeks. And she pays particular note to the excellent analogy, which is very kind. And that episode was episode 355. So if you are a relatively new podcast listener, that episode was made in January 2022. And it was titled The Difference Between the Poor and the Rich. And it was an episode where I looked at how the game was rigged in favour of wealthier people and so against people on lower incomes and I also used an analogy at the end of that show with reference to a famous book actually called Rich Dad Poor Dad and it was really explained how the rich become rich so if you haven't listened to that episode then do go and listen to it because it is very thought provoking. Okay, so shall we get on with the pod then? What have we got coming up on this week's show? So I did say that we are alone in the studio this week, but we are going to have Harvey and Laura joining us later for two pieces. But to start with, I am going to do a piece on Dr. Copper. So you may have been reading in the press or hearing concerns voiced by the likes of the Bank of England about the idea of a recession. So whether you invest or not, this piece will be relevant to you because it's about how the price of copper can give us a good indication of the likelihood of us heading towards a recession, which is a very real concern at the moment. And then Harvey is going to join us to talk about the financial impact of a cancer diagnosis. And this was inspired by the sad news that Dame Deborah James sadly passed away this week and if you listen to the podcast you'll probably have heard her podcast called You, Me and the Big C. So Harvey is going to do a piece on the financial impact of a cancer diagnosis and what steps people can take to protect their finances. Yep and Laura is going to be coming on at the end of the show to do a short piece on some news about a government-backed pilot that is providing interest-free loans for people who have been refused credit. Right. So, Damien, we're going to start with Dr. Copper. Yeah, so this piece has been inspired by an 8020 Investor newsletter that I sent out last week. And it was titled, Call the Doctor, The Economy is Sick. And I realised when I was talking about the newsletter in the office that I'd never explained the importance of the price of copper on the podcast before. I may have made fleeting references to it, but I'd never done a piece on it to explain why the price of copper is important, whether you are an investor or not. So today I want to cover that in detail. So the reason why I was talking about copper is because in recent weeks, we've seen bond yields fall. So we've seen money move back into bonds. And if you take the 10-year US Treasury yield for a broad measure of long-term bond yields, then that has fallen from 3.5% down to 3.06%. That happened in a, in a matter of days, in fact, over the last couple of weeks. It was a very big move. And when the yields fall on bonds, that means money flows into the bond market. And that rally in bonds was across the board. It wasn't just in the 10-year US Treasury note. We saw that in bond markets more broadly. And now just to remind people, bonds are attractive in a world where inflation isn't running rampant and also where there may be uncertainty about economic growth. So that's why we saw money move into bonds. And what really drove that as well was a sudden fear of a recession appearing in the near future. And that fear was really being driven by the 
idea that central banks globally are generally raising interest rates to try and quell inflation. But in doing so, they can potentially tip economies around the world into a recession. And just to explain that quickly, I always use that analogy about driving a car. If you think about central banks are trying to keep the car moving, so that is the economy. So when the rev counter goes up, they move up the gear. So when inflation gets high, they move up the gears, which means they move interest rates up. Conversely, when it looks like the economy is going to stall and the revs start to drop, so inflation might come down, they tend to move down interest rates. And of course, when you get an economy that starts to overheat, you get lots of growth, inflation tends to pick up. So that's generally why you see interest rates go up and down. So if you can drive a car, you can understand what the Bank of England does and how that relates to inflation and economic growth. Of course, if you drive a car along the road, if you keep moving up the gears, then what can happen is the revs start to drop. So yes, that's great. Inflation starts to fall. But then what that can do is it hits the economic growth, which is basically the speed of the car and the engine turning over, and you can cause it to stall. That is what can happen if you move up the gears quickly. If the car's starting to slow down, you can cause it to stall. That's the same with an economy. If you move interest rates up quickly when growth is slowing, you can cause a problem and you can cause the car to slow down and economic growth to slow down. So that's the analogy. So there was a real fear that we could end up in a recession caused by an aggressive tightening of monetary policy by central banks around the world, including our own Bank of England. And so the question became, would that sudden repricing of assets and particularly seeing money move back into bonds because that hasn't been what's been going on in the first half of 2022. Were those recession fears overdone? Was that suddenly just a panic that was overdone and we were going to see bonds maybe start to sell off again as worries about the recession started to ease? Because as you know, market narratives are very fleeting and they can change very quickly from day to day. And so in order to shed some light on that, I started to look at other assets out there to see what they were suggesting might happen, not just looking at bond markets, but looking elsewhere as well. And so before I move on to copper, don't forget the one indicator we've talked about in the past, and the show I'm thinking about is podcast episode 197, is the yield curve in bond markets. So let's take the US Treasury again. The yield curve is where you take the yield on different length bonds. So if you looked at the one year treasury, the two year, the three year, all the way up to the 10 year US treasury and beyond, and you looked at the yield on each of those, normally what happens if you're going to lend money to any government, in this case, the US government, you will get a better yield the longer you tie your money up. That makes sense. It rewards you for taking that investment risk. But in a world where maybe interest rates are going up like they are now, you can get a scenario where at the short term, because if you think about it, over the next few years, interest rates are likely to go up, then the yield that investors have to get on a shorter term treasury need to reflect the wider interest rates in the economy. So you get higher yield on those shorter term treasuries than you might do on longer term treasury. So you can see that if you were to plot those lines on the graph, the first example I gave where you get it going up over time, the yield I'm talking about, it's a curve that goes upwards. Then if interest rates are going to go up in the short term, but then people are worried that the central bank could tip the economy into a recession. And what happens when that occurs, the central bank then cuts interest rates, then what they can think is, well, in the short term, interest rates are going to be hiked, but in the longer term, they're going to actually make a mistake and have to lower them. Then you can see how the yield on shorter term treasuries will be higher than the ones over the longer term, say in 10 years. And that's called an inversion. So I'll explain more about that in that podcast episode 197. But that reversion indicator is one that people look at to say, if we see an inversion of the yield curve, particularly if you see the two-year yield being higher than the 10-year, then that is an indicator potentially of a recession. More importantly, if the one that's three months, so the yield on the three months treasury is higher than a 10 year, that's been about an 80% chance of predicting recessions in the past. That's the reliability of it. So I digress there. But that indicator has kind of been flashing on and off for the last few months that maybe there could be a recession. So looking elsewhere, what can you look at to see if there could be a recession coming? Now, copper is one such asset. Now, what makes copper interesting is that as a metal, it conducts heat, it conducts electricity, it's malleable, so it means you can bend it, it's low cost versus other metals, so it has a lot of use throughout the economy, and that can be in manufacturing, so in factories, in construction, as consumers, we use it. So as a broad 
indicator of economic growth. It is very effective. So when economies around the world are booming, the demand for copper understandably goes up. But if we start to see economic contraction or some kind of slowdown, then the demand for copper will start to fall because it's widely used. Now, that is why copper has been given this term Dr. Copper, because you can use it to try and give a indicator or an insight into economic growth globally. And so people laugh to say it's got a PhD in economics, hence the doctor title. Now, if the global economy is expanding, then the price of copper goes up. If the global economy is contracting, then the price of copper will fall. And the other thing that's interesting about copper is it gives a really good insight into the economic growth or contraction in China. Now, China's economic growth numbers or any numbers that come out of China are a bit opaque. They're largely treated with an element of suspicion because there is a lack of visibility into what's happening in China. And so that is why copper is pretty useful. So if you look at what's going on with the price of copper right now, that can give you an indication of whether we might hit a recession or not. And grab your phone And if you want to track the price of copper, then go onto your iPhone app and look at your stock app and you search for HG equals F. And that will give you a futures contract for the price of copper. Now, a futures contract is a legal agreement to buy or sell a commodity at a predetermined price at a specified time in the future. Now, all you've got to think about is it gives you a broad measure of the price of copper. And if you look at that now, what you will see is since early March, the price of copper has fallen 24%. Now that's a bear market and it is currently standing at a 16 month low. If you look at the price based upon that future contract since the start of June, now we're only talking about three weeks ago, then that fall is almost 20%. In fact, as we're making it today, the price of copper is down another one and a half percent, which does actually take it I think, to a full 20% fall in a couple of weeks. That's a huge move. So if you zoom out on your chart and look at the price of copper over the last few years, what you'll see is just at the point when the COVID vaccine was revealed that the price of copper suddenly took off and it went through the roof. And that was because the global economy, everyone was hoping it was going to start to open up again, and therefore it went through the roof. And the last year or so, it's kind of gone a bit sideways, but it's so much higher than it was at that point just after the pandemic. But of course, if you go back to the point of the pandemic, you'll see the price of copper crash as we went into lockdowns around the world because economic growth slowed. Now, what's happened is the price of copper now is heading back towards where it was not long after those COVID vaccines were announced. It's a bit higher than that at the moment, but what's important to see, it's unraveled quite a bit. So Dr. Copper, with his PhD, is setting the alarm bells ringing about the global economy. And therefore, there is a suggestion, if you look at Dr. Copper, which has been pretty accurate at predicting predicting recessions and economic contractions around the world beyond the numbers that you see that are announced by governments because don't forget those numbers are always backward looking they're not live so when we see economic data it's normally always from the previous quarter or the previous month the price of copper now is falling it's falling quite hard and it often marks when you see such big falls turning points in trends that have been happening and trends that have been happening in markets. So the question then becomes, perhaps what we see in the second half of this year could be very different from what we saw in the first half of this year. That could be pure speculation. Perhaps we might start to see more of a safety trade with the idea that central banks might not be able to raise interest rates as aggressively as they wanted to because they would send economies around the world into a recession. That could be beneficial for bonds. So bonds might be able to come out of this bear market market that they found themselves in. We don't know that. But if you look then beyond copper and start to look at other commodities that are out there, oil is up 40% year to date. But what people might not know who listen to the podcast, that it's actually down about 20% in the last few weeks as well. So technically, oil has gone into a bear market. Now, if we start seeing this in other commodities, and we are, other commodities are starting to suffer quite significant losses. If that trend continues, then that could alleviate some of the inflationary pressures that central banks are trying to battle. And therefore, that could mean that we might not see as aggressive interest rate hikes, which will therefore have a wide impact 
on investment markets more widely. So I will probably talk a lot more about that on our monthly markets update, which will be due next week now. So do listen out for that. But the message from this part of the podcast is that copper is interesting. You might not think it, but the price of copper can tell you a lot about not only what's going on in commodities, but it could also tell you about what could happen to bond markets, what could happen to equity markets, because don't forget, if we get an economic contraction and a recession, then that will likely impact profitability of companies. And certain companies might therefore do better than others in a recession. Session. So things like healthcare, utilities, and consumer staples. So there's products that we buy that we always buy. So things like cleaning products or food that we have to buy. There's certain things that we will buy regardless of a recession, and they start to outperform during recessions. If you look at history, it doesn't mean necessarily going to make a lot of money, but they will outperform things that perhaps are discretionary spending. So things that people could buy, which they will stop buying in a recession. You should look at your own spending habits to understand that. So even if you don't invest, then watching the price of copper can give you an indication about maybe we're going to have some headwinds and some challenges in our own economy and therefore our own personal finances, which might make people think about maybe battening down the hatches a little bit in their own personal finances. Okay, so let's move on to the next piece of the podcast then. And Harvey is joining the show to talk around the subject of cancer and the financial impact of having that. Now, Harvey, welcome to the show. What made us start thinking about this piece? Hi, Andy. Thanks for having me back. Um, Yeah, so Damien and I were talking about a report that we'd read. It's a fairly old report now. It's a good few years old from Macmillan. And it talks about the financial impact of cancer. And although many of us now understand the devastation that a cancer diagnosis can bring to somebody's life, very often what we miss from that discussion is the financial cost of a cancer diagnosis. And that's what we're going to address today and talk a little bit about. Obviously, we had the very sad news of Dame Deborah Jane's passing away this week and so that makes this piece extra poignant and actually the podcast that she hosted was You, Me and the Big C and she did a lot of excellent work about highlighting the devastating impacts of having cancer and the treatment. We're going to go a little bit deeper on the financial side of things because obviously that's what we do on the podcast and Harvey you've got some figures you're going to run through some key excerpts from the Macmillan Cancer Report. Indeed Andy so a lot of what we discovered through the Macmillan Report that we read recently was just that people are perhaps not aware of the financial impact of a cancer diagnosis and the wider picture is that on average four out of five people are £570 a month worse off because of their diagnosis. And so this report was from a few years ago now, and obviously we've experienced high inflation. There's no doubt that those figures are only going one way. It's going to be more than that now. So what else did this Macmillan report highlight in terms of the cost that people are having to shoulder upon diagnosis? So immediately for most people, a diagnosis might lead to time out away from work, to have treatment. A lot of whether your income carries on is the discretion of the people that pay you your wages. So if you've got a a great employer and they carry on paying you through your treatment period, that's brilliant. But that's not the experience of everyone. And the Macmillan report goes some way towards describing the reality of people's situations when they are hit by the devastating news that A, they have cancer, but B, they may be now struggling with holding down a job, earning an income, paying their rent, paying for their living. And that is what we want to talk about today. So you've mentioned there about the loss of income is obviously a big concern for a lot of people, but there's other costs that are incurred that people might not necessarily think about? What what sort of costs would they be? So a while back, um, some of our regular listeners will remember that we interviewed Emma, who had suffered breast cancer, and her experience of the cancer that she suffered and the financial impact it had and how she was helped by various insurances that she had. It was a very powerful piece, very personal piece, and she described a lot of the ways in which her cancer diagnosis affected her. I mean, across the board, people will find that they've got costs associated with their cancer diagnosis, including tax taxis back and forth from hospitals. Now, hospitals may not be in your immediate vicinity. They might be quite far from you. You may need to travel quite far to where the treatment is being carried 
out. Your family members who want to be with you may need to find accommodation close to where you are in order to be by your side. Other costs include childcare. So even if you're not earning an income, but you provide the main childcare in your home for your partner to continue to go to work and do what they're doing to earn a living, you may have to employ somebody to look after your children. And these are all realities that cancer patients face. And perhaps we don't really consider carefully when we're thinking about the likelihood of cancer affecting our lives. And we mentioned that Emma podcast again there, Harvey, just for listeners who are interested to listen to that. It was an excellent episode. It's episode 295. So go back on the website or via your podcast app and find that and listen to it because it really does highlight some of those key things that you've just mentioned. So I just want to jump in there, Harv, because one of the things that recently I've been thinking personally is pondering this idea about what would happen if, say, for example, I got cancer and I have certain insurances in place. And so you think about the reality that, well, okay, I might not be able to work for a period of time. But I also have been thinking more about the idea of living with cancer because income protection, for example, we'll talk about these things later. I might have insurances that will pay if I can't work. But initially, I might be able to work. And also, life insurance won't pay out until I actually die. So I started to think about how would it impact my family if I was diagnosed with cancer, because maybe nothing will fundamentally change initially. That's absolutely right, Damien. For a lot of people, if they're diagnosed with cancer, life can carry on, you know, depending on the symptoms that they're suffering and how much it's affecting them in their daily lives. It may not change anything at all initially. But as soon as treatment starts, for those more progressive types of cancers, you will find that people go through periods of recovery, periods of treatment, periods when they're not able to work or function within their family situations as they had done when they were healthy. And the added crunch with cancer is that even once you've been through that process and you've had treatment and you've made a recovery, it's always in the back of your mind because you've got to get through that remission period, you're worried that the cancer might come back, that it might take its toll again. And it's something that Emma talked about when she spoke to us on the podcast about her experience is that she's had to squirrel away some of the money from her insurances and not spend it for her immediate needs because she doesn't know whether that cancer may come back. And that is one of the nastier sides of cancer diagnosis as opposed to other types of illnesses. And I know there was a stat in that report that said I think there's 2.5 million people living with cancer today in the UK and that's going to grow to 4 million by 2030. So this is a a reality that people do live longer with cancer which is a positive but again there's going to be a a longer financial impact for those people as well. But I was also thinking for me personally, listen to some of the additional costs you mentioned, I've been thinking about what would happen if my wife got cancer or we did cover before in a previous podcast if one of my children did and of course there's that accommodation thing that you would personally listen to this podcast, want to go and visit or be near the person in your family who might have cancer as well so this isn't just a a piece about us individually who are listening to this podcast it's about other people within our families to think about this in the in the round how would we cope financially what would be the impact in the short to medium term if you had a cancer diagnosis so you actually had some interesting excerpts from that study as well didn't you that really drove home what it's like financially to be diagnosed with cancer absolutely Damien so one of them reads from a a young man going to the job center after my treatment to apply for universal credit was mind numbing, sitting in front of a computer for six hours to fill the thing in. No one told me how the benefit system worked. But what was more shocking was the way in which I was spoken to, told I should just move back with my parents, despite them living hundreds of miles away in Scotland, away from my home in London that I'd lived in for seven years. Another person said it was nine months before anybody acknowledged my cancer diagnosis, just felt like the system wasn't set up to support anyone living with cancer. These are people who are struggling to use the system state to support them because many of us fall into that bracket of people who think, well, if something goes horribly wrong, the state will intervene. And we might be people who have never had to rely on the state. We don't really understand how the benefit system works. And in turn, what we don't realise is a lot of it's broken. A lot of it is delayed. A lot of it is not the kind of process that somebody who 
is struggling with the fact that they've just been diagnosed with cancer should really have to face. And there isn't much allowance for that. There was a woman who was in the case studies who said that she was £2,500 behind on her rent. And she actually worried about getting home from hospital one day and finding an eviction notice on her door and living constantly in fear that she'd have nowhere to live you know, despite the fact that she had cancer and she was having treatment and had a young child to look after. And these are the realities that people face when they're living with cancer. So although there's a lot of progress made and, you know, we see people living longer and longer, there is a a statistic that shows us that people are now twice as likely to survive for 10 years after a cancer diagnosis than they were 40 years ago. So we're making progress in terms of treatment of cancer, but are we really making the same kinds of progress when it comes to supporting people financially and otherwise who are living with cancer? Because that's a really important point, Harvey, and and the answer really is no, the state isn't really doing anything to support people who might be living longer with cancer, which is why this part of the podcast is important, because the message for people that the reality is you need to start thinking about what you can do yourself to be able to support you and your family if the unfortunate is to happen, and just obviously the odds are that now one in two people will get cancer so it seems awful to say it but half our listeners listen to this episode will likely have a cancer diagnosis at some point okay so we've talked a lot there harvey about the problems that exist let's look at some solutions now what can you give us in terms of what support there is maybe for vulnerable people and for other people who want to find a solution So vulnerable people is a term that is well understood by most financial organisations. So I would encourage listeners who are struggling with their mortgage lender, their loan provider, their landlord, anyone who they owe money to. If those people are struggling to get support, that they highlight that they are a vulnerable person. Now, that is not the simplest thing to do, because when you're ill, you may be quite proud. You know, many people don't want to say that they're sick. But it is important to highlight to financial institutions like banks and other people that you might be dealing with that you are in a vulnerable situation. And vulnerability is really marked by anything like poor health, cognitive impairment, low resilience to cope with financial or emotional shocks, low capability such as poor literacy and numeracy skills. That last one really interested me because there's a number of people in my life where English isn't their first language and actually they'd be considered vulnerable people. If they walked into a bank, they'd have to be treated carefully because those people need a bit more support to ensure that they're making good decisions for themselves and that they're getting adequate support. For those of our listeners, Andy, who thankfully haven't been diagnosed with cancer and are healthy, but worry about the statistic of one in two people suffering cancer during their working lives, there are measures that they can take in order to prevent financial hardship. And these come in the form of certain kinds of insurances. There are a lot of people that will see the headlines in the papers every day at the moment saying there are X number of people sitting in queues waiting for cancer treatment. And that's quite quite a worrying statistic for most. We don't want to become part of that statistic. We don't want to be sitting around waiting for treatment for something as serious as cancer. And unfortunately, the way that the NHS is working at the moment, that is a reality that many people are facing. Now, things like health insurance, which we write a lot about and we have extensive information about on our website, can bridge the gap to private healthcare. And that might mean that you are diagnosed sooner, that you are treated sooner and that you can get back to your normal life sooner and those are things that will be important to us and actually there's different types of health insurance we explain it all on the website but there are particular types of health insurance that have advanced cancer cover as part of the standard cover so some health insurance policies you have to pay extra for things like mental health cover or cancer covers but often extensive cancer cover is covered as standard so it's worth looking around again we'll put links to health insurance and the types of policies you might be considering in regard to cancer on the podcast notes so what other policies can people look at even something as simple as a life insurance insurance policy and a will include something like terminal illness benefits. So if somebody is at the worst end of scale of a cancer diagnosis and has stage four terminal cancer that they can't be treated for essentially, the life insurance can pay out early under a terminal illness benefit. 
And that can alleviate a lot of the financial difficulty that person would face at the end of their life when actually really what they want to do is enjoy their time with their family and not worry about paying the bills. So that's another one. Something I'd like to say about life insurance policies is sometimes they're really worthwhile having because they've got added benefits like second medical opinions that you can access. They might even have a dedicated nurse service so that if you're diagnosed with cancer, that you can get counselling help, that you can get mental health help. But also that you can get a second medical opinion to your diagnosis. A lot of people may struggle to understand whether the treatment that they're going to have is the best treatment that they can have. Perhaps they want to explore all avenues. They want to be sure that they and their consultant together have made the best decisions for their health. And that can give you great peace of mind. And a lot of these kinds of benefits are rolled into life insurance policies for free. So you can access them. So if you don't have health insurance policy and you don't have critical illness insurance policy or an income protection insurance policy, look at your life insurance policy and see whether there are benefits within that that could still support you. So you mentioned a couple of other policies there and they're key policies as well. Critical illness and also income protection. Critical illness, what's that and how can that help? So critical illness cover is a policy that covers you for a list of illnesses. It does vary from one insurance company to another. So I'd always say to our listeners, go out and look for the best kind of policy you possibly can, get some advice. A lot of it's technical jargon and medical jargon. So many of us don't understand exactly what they pay out for, but they're quite specific in their nature. So they pay out for certain things. And many of these policies won't cover all cancers, but generally all of them will cover invasive and spreading cancers, which are the ones that terrify us the most. And that's a lump sum payment. So you're going to get a a big amount, whatever you insure yourself for. So it's not an income that's dripping in. It will be, say, 10, 20, 50,000, whatever you can afford. What sort of cost are we looking at on critical illness cover? When we look at the cost of things like critical illness cover, Andy, they are more expensive than life insurance. Life insurance, you could probably buy for five, 10 pounds a month if you're a healthy, fairly young person. The cost is dependent on your age and whether you smoke and things like that and your current health as well but what I'd say to people that are listening is that if you've bought 200 300 thousand pounds worth of life cover don't necessarily look for the same amount of critical illness cover assign yourself a budget if you can afford to spend another 20 pounds on getting some critical illness cover then buy what you can get for your money And that's what's important is spend what you can afford. It will still get you some cover. And even if it's not the amount of cover that you would ideally want, having some amount of money at a crucial moment like that is better than nothing. So one way to frame this piece of the podcast is that there are different stages of obviously a cancer diagnosis. There's the unfortunate point of diagnosis. And then you've got the if you were to die from it. But really, we're thinking about that battle period. If some of these insurances can give you some money to help with that battle you're going to go through, that can take an extended period of time. So even if it's only for tens of thousands of pounds, that money maybe from a critical insurance policy, that can help with that battle that you're going to probably have for probably a few years. One final thing before you go, Harv, I want to ask is there may be people listening, well, there will be statistically, who have had cancer and they've gone through that battle and they've come out the other end and they're now listening to this and thinking, I am know what it was like when I had that battle. What about them? Because we're talking about people who obviously haven't had cancer yet. What about the people who've had cancer? Are they now excluded from some of these insurance products like critical illness? They're not necessarily excluded. The problem is that if you've already had a cancer diagnosis, it is very difficult to buy a product that will then pay out if you then are again diagnosed with cancer. That doesn't mean to say that you can't cover yourself against other serious illnesses like strokes, heart attacks. Heart disease is massive in our country. So we shouldn't sort of say to people that it's not important to cover yourself against other illnesses if you've suffered cancer. But if you want cancer specific cover, that is difficult to get, but it will depend on the type of cancer you had the staging of your cancer and how long it's been since you've made that recovery. So if you're a good few years on from a diagnosis and recovery from that diagnosis, you should speak to an expert and you should get advice on whether you can get insurances and which kinds of insurances you have access to, because there are always insurance companies out there trying to offer products to people who have a history of health problems. So we will link in the show notes to articles relating to 
how much critical illness insurance costs, getting critical illness cover. If you've already had cancer in the past, Harvey's done a lot of work in that area. So we'll link to some of her articles and other types of insurances that Andy has already mentioned. So make sure you check out the show notes of the podcast and also the article on the website like we do every week that has links to those particular articles. Okay, so let's welcome Laura back to the show who's going to talk about a government-backed scheme that's been extended this week in terms of interest-free loans for people who really need it. What's happened this week? So the No Interest Loan Scheme was piloted last year for a small audience and it's been announced this week that it's going to be extended from September. And what this scheme does is it offers interest-free loans to vulnerable people who have been turned down for credit elsewhere. Um, It's not something that you can apply for directly. Uh, You have to be referred perhaps by a housing association or a credit union. But what it does is it extends a loan of up to £2,000 And the aim is that that money is used for emergency essentials or something that's going to be, you know, deeply beneficial to that person. Um, So examples that have been given of how it's been used during the pilot is to fund say a school uniform at the beginning of the school year to enable someone to buy a laptop or some other tech that enables them to work more efficiently or even things like driving lessons or going towards insurance or running of a car to get somebody into a position where they can go back to work. Also things like emergencies if a household appliance suddenly breaks and that needs to be replaced. It's for those types of unforeseen expenditure that this scheme has been established and has proved to be popular during the the initial pilot. Okay, so it's up to £2,000. And what sort of period does that need to be paid over? And what determines the loan repayment period? So the loan can be anywhere between £100 to £2,000. On average, the scheme is anticipating that most of the loans are going to be around the £500 mark. And that's going to be determined by the person's need, what they perhaps originally applied for from another lender and have been rejected for, and also their individual circumstances and the affordability of the loan. And similarly, the time period that it can be paid back over is going to be between six up to a maximum of 18 months. And again, that's based on the individual circumstances of the applicant. And a nice sort of flexible element of it is that it can be repaid either weekly or monthly rather than the usual monthly payments that are standard on most loans. This has that option of being able to pay smaller amounts more regularly, perhaps to fit in with those who are paid weekly or those who are receiving benefits. Okay, so that sounds great news for those that have struggled in the past to access credit. Maybe if done in the right way through the right means, they'll be able to access this money. Is there any potential negatives that people need to think about before they embark on looking at these types of loans? I have to admit, I have got some misgivings about the loans, particularly as some of the details around it are quite patchy as it stands at the moment. So the scheme's been developed by the government, by the Treasury, and uh, it's working alongside a lender, JP Morgan Chase, but also a non-profit organisation called Fair for All Finance. And the reason that that rang a bell with me was a piece that we've spoken about on the podcast before, which was loans for people buying groceries through Iceland supermarket and the potential issue with that arrangement and something that's repeated with this arrangement is it's really unclear what happens in terms of people's credit scores, credit reports and what happens if people can't afford to make the repayments. So in the case of the no interest loan scheme, it hasn't been stated yet what happens when someone gets to the end of the 18 month maximum loan period if they can't or won't make those repayments. The organisers haven't yet stated whether at that point interest will start accruing on the loan, whether it will be passed on to debt management agencies and whether it will then have a negative impact on those people's credit scores, which may make it even more challenging to secure finance in the future. 
So that's interesting stuff. It is a positive. And the reason we bring it up in the podcast is as we approach September, this is going to be rolled out to more people. So there may be people on this podcast that have got friends of friends or extended members of family that they know are going through hardship or need to retrain to do perhaps another job or get back into work. So this may be something for them. Yeah, what I would say is just people who are referred for these loans need to really carefully consider whether they're going to be able to make the repayments, whether this is actually going to be an affordable way for them to borrow and also to look into whether there are perhaps other avenues open to them and whether they can get support for these kind of expenses through their council or through other charities or schemes that may already be set up to provide things like access to tech or support for unforeseen costs. So I'd always recommend going down that route first before taking on an additional dance. So Laura, thanks ever so much for coming back onto the show and going through that interesting stuff. So Damien, that's it. We're done for this week. Yeah, we are done. As I mentioned earlier in the podcast, don't forget to listen out for my market update this week. We do it at the beginning of each month, so it will be out on Wednesday or Thursday next week. And yes, as ever, please leave a review of the podcast on whatever app or platform that you use to listen to us and do spread the word about money to the masses as well so if you see our social media posts make sure you like them share them so it can help us help more people so i think that's it andy till next time until next time oh.